And so the pig and place machine we have can do 8,000 components an hour. If you look at those boards, there's not really that many components on them. And that's kind of an ideal number. Realistically, we can put a panel of 36 of those boards through about every five minutes. Um, that's not really the bottleneck of the operation right now. Uh, you have to, to screen print them there, and, and we've had some issues with that, and we've actually upgraded our line with a fully automatic screen printer. But the biggest thing that's taking time right now is the depaneling of the boards, actually cutting them out and testing them. Just because we were doing a lot of things manually, we had some, some issues with just the manufacturing, so there's a lot of hand rework right now. But ideally, that's going to go way down. So theoretically, we could do 36 boards every five minutes, which somebody can help me with the math. That's a couple boards. What is that? Six boards a minute, maybe. Again, that's an absolute max. And that's with the current set. There's no reason we couldn't. If, if we got anywhere near that, we'd probably look to upgrade. We, that machine, the pick and place, is, I think, 1996 vintage. So it's certainly not the newest thing on the market. So if we got anywhere near reaching the capacity of that, we'd likely buy a newer machine, higher capacity machine. Also, from a risk standpoint, if that was to go down, we're actually shipping out that much stuff. If it went down for a day, that'd be a problem. Somebody else? I've got a request to please make a Stellaris device. It's the next step up on the MS Pro. Okay. Put on the list. Of can you can you repeat that for the mic? What what, 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 what yeah what device? He wants a Stellaris device. Oh okay. Which is a TI micro. Okay. Why, why do you think the Arduino beat TI? Uh, community. From a technical standpoint, 8-bit micros are for the most part 8-bit micros. I mean it. it, it my day job, in the, what I've done for the last 15 years, is embedded software development for the most part and some embedded hardware. But most small micros are relatively the same. They all have, obviously they have an ALU, but they also have similar memory structures. They also have similar you know, peripheral sets, timers, URs, and whatnot. Um, so I think it helped that it wasn't the main vendor themselves doing it. It was an outside group, and also the outside group uh, developed a nice suite of software tools and they got community support behind it. Again, I'm not sure why, what the, the magic was there, why it took off, but it, it did. I know TI with Launchpad and different things have very low cost development tools. And the TI Launchpad is $4.30 for the MSP430. Um, so it's kind of hard to beat that in price. And a lot of people do use it, but it's not nearly as popular as an Arduino, which costs you know, six, seven times as much. I'm, again, I'm not sure why, other than just community support. Have any of your Kickstarter recipients shared with you what they plan to do with it? Uh, anything kind of cool? And after you created your first one, did, what did you hook it up to and what did you do with it? Did you remember? Besides uh, last time. <laughs> I think I blinked a light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of designed this for myself and I haven't really had a chance to use it. Um, <laughs> I doubt I ever will. Um, certainly blinking LEDs. Uh, as part of the Kickstarter video, I did drive a little OLED display just to kind of show the capabilities. So if you've seen that, there's just a little display, some motor drivers, really things to test out the boards. So I haven't actually used one in a true application other than testing things, kind of showing examples. Um, in terms of what people have planned for it, I, there's a few hundred that actually have them already. Um, I haven't seen any projects come back. It's really just been over the last four weeks or so that we've really been shipping any volume, about 30, 40 a day. Um, but in terms of, there's a, a group out of, I forget what university they're out of, in Southern California, they're actually developing a quadcopter. And they, they got some early prototypes last fall. And so they actually did show off, I have some videos of it, this quadcopter that they developed. So again, very small quadcopter, so I think about six inches which is pretty small once you're taking the propellers into consideration. So they have a tiny Duino on there. They actually have a XB wired in as well, just because we didn't have anything at the time that could do wireless back. And unfortunately, the video I saw that actually flipped that side and crashed. And <laughs> I don't oh. think it was the tiny Duino that caused it. I think it's cool. uh, Then there's, there's um, a PhD candidate uh, out of Oxford.
Oxford, I believe, that's based in Africa. He's doing a climate uh, change survey. And actually, we have this all documented on the website. He contacted me last fall when the Kickstarter was going on, telling me about his application, just would it be possible. And so he wants to put very cheap sensors all across the nature preserve, I think in Kenya. Uh, so a few hundred sensors spaced a few miles apart and just log temperature over time, over a year period, and then go out and collect those. So he wants like a micro SD card, something very low cost, because he doesn't have that much funding, but you can easily buy a system like this and spend you know, 30, 40 bucks per node. Just put it out there, log data, and then you know, graph that, because the temperature variation is actually quite significant out across an area. And so using standard techniques would just be too costly to monitor all that, more than just a few points throughout a few hundred miles, square mile preserve. Cool. So. You mentioned that uh, all of this hardware, uh, you know, your design files are open source. Uh, have you been designing using open source software? And how have you found that experience? No. Um, the big open source software for Schematic is, is Gita. Uh, but for whatever reason, again, we kind of borrowed from the legacy of what's out there. Most people in this market are developing using Eagle which there is a freeware version available. And so people can download it and edit the files and actually design boards around those if they had the freeware version. There are limitations to that. You know, they only do a two layer board and there's only a certain size. Our stuff, we've stuck to that. You know, it's been somewhat difficult for some of the sizes we're doing. Just so if people want to, they can open the files. And there's, I mean, open source hardware is kind of a, a liquid definition of what that means, but um, you can certainly use proprietary software um, and license your files. But yeah, we're, we're using Eagle for everything, um, which is supported by CADSoft, I think is the company behind it. Actually, Eagle, you know, it, you know I kind of work for a design firm that's been my background, so we use rather high end development tools. But I've been rather impressed with Eagle as a, a free, even the free version, you can do quite a bit with it. And so I haven't had run into any issues just using that for our files. We're not doing that anything that cutting edge though, so I'm sure you'd run into some limitations at some point. How much money are you leaving on the table for not shipping this in China to make this stuff? In this case, I don't think much. Um, the one thing that's different from ours than a lot of other projects is we have such a wide variety of boards that we're manufacturing. So the, the quantities of any given board really isn't that high. Uh, so if you were to ship that overseas, if we're building 100,000 of one board, I don't think we could compete with that just in terms of cost. But if they have to set up the machine for all these different boards all the time and do small batches, which is kind of our goal, which is why we actually purchased and invested in the machines in-house, that the cost to tear down a machine and reset it up is actually where most of the cost comes down. So if you're building one board, it could be a couple thousand bucks. Building two, there's a small adder on top of that, and it goes down pretty exponentially, you know, the more you do. So obviously, in volume, prices come down significantly. But we're doing small batches of things. And so the nice thing with having our own machine is we can kind of leave it set up. Or a typical manufacturer, they're constantly changing in and out parts all day long and charging you for that setup time. Well, we don't have that. We have a machine dedicated to our stuff that's just set up. If we want to run a board, we can just paste it and put it in there. We don't have to set up a machine. Just push a button and go. Um, most places, you, you can't do that. You're charged eight hours of time just to set it up. So if you do it here locally, you're looking at probably a thousand bucks just to run a single board, even though you might only have a few components on it. Obviously, it goes down in volume. The same thing going overseas. So we really wanted to stay here uh, for a few different reasons, but we thought it made business sense as well. So it wasn't just out of you know, charity. Yep. Uh, the overseas issue brings up another question. Uh, do you source your boards, your PCBs, domestically, or does that have to go over for cost? Right now we're going over for cost. Okay. Um, our volume isn't that high. So. We certainly looked at doing it locally, or I mean in the US. It was just significantly different, like 5x different. And so we couldn't do it. Um, 
we do want to long term. And once we get volumes up, again, it's the same sort of thing. In volumes, things come down. Uh, it's kind of hard to compete in the printed circuit board market. Um, but there are, I've used a number of US companies that are very good. But again, we're not doing anything that complex. So a lot of these, I wouldn't say sloppier shops, but you don't need a super high tolerance shop that has military type board capabilities to do it. Um, but yeah, cost, again, it's somewhat hypocr uh, hypocritical to say, you know, we're doing things in the US and then buying boards from overseas, but it's kind of what we're doing right now. And realistically, all the electronic components are, I mean, you're not going to get those from the US source. Even though it's a US company, they're not manufacturing silicon over here. Well, microchip is. That's what it is. Yeah? It seems like perhaps one way you achieve your cost breakthrough is that you're, uh, you're making something like surface mount device breakout boards. Smartphone used to do something like that, but their devices always seem a little bit more expensive. And uh, I was wondering if maybe you have other devices or kits which will maybe help the user with the small uh, side pads and also maybe to deal with uh, you know, service mount component discrete devices that they may want to uh, kind of add on. But, like in other words, if they wanted to come off this board, are they going to have to put in a, uh, a plug into the header? Yes. Uh, on that main board, yes. Uh, you can't really solder to that. It's not really designed for that. There are, you can kind of see down there, a little picture doesn't show too well, on the lower right, there is the power input. If you don't use the battery, you want to clip up something else. But realistically, the vision is on the top of whatever stack you do, if you saw the stack going around, there's what we call as a prototyping board, which breaks out the signals to solder points. And there's a few different variations of those. One has every single signal, but it's relatively small. Then there's another one that use, uses standard tension spacing, which again is the same as the standard Arduino. It doesn't break out every single signal, but it's a couple different variations, so you can kind of choose what you want. And those are like $3.95 in a single piece of quantities, so relatively low cost boards that you can almost throw away. But uh, you kind of need one of those. Now the other one, this tiny lily, there's eight IOs there that you can directly solder to. So if cost is a huge issue, and you're not doing anything that sophisticated, blinking some lights or who knows what, you can easily solder to that directly. And that's, that's some 10 bucks. So. Cool. I think uh, we'll wrap up the Q&A. And if you have more questions, we can just open it up to kind of a general discussion amongst everybody. Uh, so you're going to hang around for a little bit, chat for a little bit. So uh, everybody, thank you, uh, Ken, for coming out.